because <laughs> what happens is people are subtweeting you or talking about you uh, in a way that they obviously don't want you to know. If they wanted you to know, they would tag you. And so if you go looking for stuff, you'll find uh, lots of vitriol, things like that. And I, I invite criticism, you know, constructive, I guess, or otherwise. But I assume if somebody wants to actually address it to me, they'll just tag me directly. And I'm even if someone says something nasty, if I can, I'll answer and I'll be, you know, take the high road and, and that's that. But yeah. yeah, there's not much constructive to be had by Twitter searching yourself. It's like going on to a YouTube link and trying to read the comments. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not a good idea. Hey, Jonah, I got a question for you. How how many, so if someone were to tweet you, what would be the odds of you seeing it? How often do you do you look at your replies? Uh, I, I'm online all the time because I'm either writing or gathering material to write pretty much all the time. Certainly during the week. Certainly like if you're talking Monday to Friday, then yeah. Uh, but even weekends too. And so it's it's reasonably likely that I'll see it. Um, I can't say that I'll see all of them. I do my best to answer as many as I can. Uh, you know, certainly if it's something substantive, I'll try. And uh, even if I don't know the answer, I'll be like, I don't know the answer. So yeah, no, but I do my best. I view it as a dialogue. I'm a very kind of high energy guy and I want to be interacting with people anyway. And I work, I've been working from home since 2005. So frankly, like, it's great. It's like having people in my office. It's just, oh, okay, let's, let's chat. So I enjoy it. How often do you think athletes read read the replies on social media, and and how do you think that affects the the psyche of certain players going in and out of different games? I've heard the argument a lot that Michael Jordan was able to be as successful as he was because he wasn't dealing with all the flame wars that 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 can pop up on Twitter and, and get inside your head. So, well, how do you think that changes well, the way athletes play the game? I mean, I get that to some extent, but then Steph Curry and LeBron live in the age of of Twitter, and they're not having a problem. So right I don't off know, of them, yeah. right? In, in some, yeah, some yeah. or or they just don't take it that seriously. I mean, it's you know, ultimately, there are people that are going to. Tear, I mean, you know, it's different for me. I'm some you know, C level writer or whatever. But you know, if you're talking about Steph Curry and and, and LeBron and Jordan or whatever, that they they don't have to prove anything to anybody. I mean, they're obviously elite, objectively by any measure, they are. And so they'll just do their thing, and that's that. And uh, yeah, I, I don't see that as necessarily. Uh, something that they would get worried about. But the answer could differ for every athlete. You know, I think I'm kind of atypical in that I really am trying to engage as much as possible. I'm not just saying that I really do. Um, just because, just because I like doing it. But so some athletes will get involved in that and some won't. It sort of depends. I will say that, you know, being an athlete has a short shelf life. Um, some sports more than others. Certainly football is a big one. But if you put yourself out there that way and develop kind of an online personality, that can be kind of interesting because what, what has happened in the past is if you were a player in any sport and you presented yourself intelligently and maybe you were funny or whatever, you might end up with a media career afterwards, which you can make money and you can kind of stay in the mix and whatever. And I think what you might see happening now in the next few years is uh, guys who've been active on Twitter or wherever and they're funny and they're interesting could end up with analyst jobs. I think of somebody like Brandon McCarthy. Brandon McCarthy is a pretty good, talented pitcher. Uh, but great on Twitter. And, you know, when his career ends, whenever that might happen, uh, then maybe ESPN or MLB Network will come calling and be like, yeah, we know McCarthy's funny and smart because we've seen his tweets. Let's give him a studio run and see. And sure enough, he's good on camera and boom, he's got a job. So I can see that happening. Not not that I'm saying that, that uh, athletes are being opportunistic. I just think that is an opportunity that could present itself. No, I, th to that. No, I think you're exactly right. I think the uh, natural extension to a to an athlete, athlete's career is to take some type of analyst role because they've seen the game firsthand. And you look at Charles Woodson, a guy who just retired in the NFL, he's going to be joining, I think it's Monday Night Football next next year. So how, how do you feel about, I don't know about necessarily job security, but how, how do you feel that affects the dynamics between when uh, Harold Reynolds talks about baseball and, and he's played the game versus uh, you jumping on and, and sharing your thoughts and opinions? What's the dynamic between the two analysts who have played the game and, and, and have observed the game for many years? Yeah, I, th I think these are, are two sides of the same coin in a sense. Uh, just speaking from personal experience, I just started, uh, I did a MLB Network in studio for the first time last month. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first panel that I sat down with was um, Dan O'Dowd was there, a former GM of the Rockies. Brian Kenny's the host. And sitting to my left was Mike Lowell. Mike Lowell, very accomplished third baseman, World Series champion, all that. Had never met me, knew I knew nothing about me, just I sat down next to him. And uh, he provided some really good insight. I think I provided some pretty good insight. At the end of the show, he goes, I've never met, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, I've never met a stats nerd uh, with as much enthusiasm as you have. So I think it's, you know, it's the job of both sides to, to come correct. You know, if you're an ex-athlete, 
you need to not you need to have present an insider perspective, but also be personable and interesting and whatever. And if you are uh, somebody who's an analyst, whether a stats based analyst or somebody who breaks stories like a Ken Rosenthal or whatever, you need to bring some of your own personality to that too, and, and understand how to speak to the other side. Uh, you know, be able to bridge the gap between you. I've played one year of little league. I was a pretty good basketball player, sure. terrible baseball. And so I need to be able to speak their language and, and to connect and, and so forth. And, and I think that can make for good TV. I did do a show when I was there with Reynolds. It was more of kind of a morning, joking around, wearing casual clothes kind of show. But it was great. We had a good time. And uh, I think that all you have to do is, is be smart and be a person and you'll be fine. Uh, I can answer some more, some more of these questions that were presented beforehand, I guess. Uh, let's see. Oh, hang on. Okay. Uh, so Thomas Stockline asks, are there currently any plans to turn the extra 2% into a movie similar to baseball? So I've written two books, solo anyway. Uh, the most recent one is called Up, Up and Away. It was about the Montreal Expos. It's really fun. I grew up a big Expos fan. Uh, this was a passion project. It has everything you could possibly ever want to know about this franchise. I talked to Pedro Martinez and Andre Dawson and Tim Raines and all these great people. And, and you should read that. It's great. Uh, extra 2% was the first one that I wrote. And, um, it's been cited in comparison to Moneyball just because it deals with the idea of a low revenue team and what they could do to try to overcome it. Uh, I don't think I'm exactly the same kind of writer as Michael Lewis, but you know, I think that the extra two percent is pretty good. And um, you know, in the answer to the question, what I would say is basically that's not an opportunity that's been presented to me. But if you have a production company that can make that happen, sure, that's fine. Let's go make a movie. Uh, but otherwise, I think the book stands on its own, and I feel uh, pretty good about it. Sure. Hey, Jonah, talk to me a little bit more about about Tim Raines. Uh, I know your pin tweet is a, is a Vine clip of you actively campaigning for his uh, inclusion in the Hall of Fame. Tell me a little bit about uh, that campaign and what you've been doing to to rightfully put Tim Raines in the uh, the Hall of Fame next year. Yeah, I mean, he was my favorite player of all time. I grew up in Montreal. His rookie season happened when I was six, um, so right in my wheelhouse. And uh, it's one of those things that it's a combination of fandom and it happens that he's a guy who's also disrespected um, by some of the mainstream or has been in the past, whereas by analytics, he's so obviously a Hall of Famer. Uh, there are two things that come to mind, and I'll give you the weaker point first. Mm -hmm. There are five guys in Major League history who've stolen 800 bases. Reigns is the only one of the five who's not in the Hall of Fame. And he also has the highest percentage success rate of any pl player by a mile within any number, anywhere close to as many attempts. He's stolen almost 85% successfully. Uh, Ricky Henderson, as an example, is, you know, stole 1,300 odd bases, but got caught a bunch more. If Reigns ran with as much reckless abandon, he'd be coming up on a 1,000. So that's one. And then two is uh, the one that really sticks with me because you could take away the base dealing and just think about things in terms of reaching base. You know, the old expression that a walk is as good as a hit, right? You know, if you get a the single through the hole, you could just walk. It's the same thing. Tony Gwynn sailed into the Hall of Fame, one of the highest percentages ever is 97 or 98%. I think it's 97 and change the first try uh, because he had 3,000 hits and he won a bunch of batting titles. That's all great. Tim, Tony Gwynn's a great player. Tim Raines reached base more times than Tony Gwynn did in his career. Uh, so if we're talking, if a walk is as good as a hit, then the 3,000 hits becomes irrelevant because Reigns had 2,605 hits and also 1,330 walks. By the way, that's more times on base also than Hannes Wagner or Roberto Clemente. So, I mean, there really is not much of an argument if you care at all about walks. If you think that walks matter and he was a leadoff guy, so that's even more important, then of course he should be a leadoff. What do you? And so what I've been trying to do is just kind of raise awareness and, and make people know. And I've convinced a few BBWA voting uh, writers to, to vote for Reigns. Uh, I don't have a vote yet. I am a member of DBWA, but you need to be a member for 10 years. Hmm. So all I could do is advocacy and, and we'll see. And his, not, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how much credit I can take, but uh, his own resume and maybe a little bit of nudge from people like me has gotten him up to about 70% of the vote as of the last one. He's got one year left. Uh, I need 75 and uh, I feel pretty confident that he'll get it. Well, how much, how much do you think the fact that the Montreal Expos are a disbanded team has to play with it? Because you see current athletes today you know, they'll, they'll beat records of their former great teammates, right? The, the all-time uh, leading hits for, you know, let's say the Texas Rangers. That can't happen right now for the Montreal Expos. We don't have that context to, to compare Tim Raines to to anybody else because there's, there's no Montreal Expos right now. How much, does, how much does that play into sort of the out-of-sight, out-of-mind factor that could be playing into his uh, uh, not being in the hall this year? I really think it's just a hits thing. I think that if people just forgot about the 3,000 hits he'd be in, it's just, it's numerical illiteracy. That's all it is. Let me glance at his numbers. No 3,000 hits. I'm not honestly, like I think people are 
in this particular case, they are displaying ignorance and stupidity. I cannot say it any more clearly than that. If you don't vote for Reigns, you're wrong. I, I just, by any objective standard, he obviously should be in the Hall of Fame, and, and you're just not picking up on the fact that walks are important, and that's it. And I'm not a mean guy, and I don't toss bombs most of the time, but this pisses me off. I don't, I don't understand it. Obviously, I have a vested interest as a fan, uh, but I also think that just in terms of justice, he should be in. There are way a lot of inferior candidates who are already in, and Reigns has this quirky stat line and whatever. He played for Montreal, blah, blah, blah. 3,000 hits, that's all it is. And that by hits plus walks, he should obviously be in. Uh, let's go to another question here. Da, 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 da. Uh, what activity, sport, or hobby were you incredibly passionate about as a kid? Curious to know. Uh, what hashtag we learned from. This is from Casey Millhouse. Uh, everything's coming up, Millhouse, which is the, te if anybody texts me, that's what my phone says. So obviously you're in the right ballpark. Casey Millhouse. Uh, the answer to that question is that even though I cover baseball for a living, I grew up playing basketball and I've played it most of my life. Uh, I'm very tall. I was, I'm 6'4", and I was 6'4 when I was 14. So I had that going for me, uh, which is nice. Uh, and, it's, and the thing about it is personality wise, I'm very high affect. And so, especially in my teens and 20s, if I didn't play basketball for a couple of days, I'd get kind of shaky. Like it was just, it was not good. It was, I needed to have that to keep myself centered and blow off steam and so forth so that I could be the normal, uh, pleasant person uh, that I think I am. So, so there was that. Uh, I continue to play sometimes, not as much as I used to because my knees are not great because I played for 30 years. Uh, recreationally or competitively um but yeah that, that was the big one for me it was always uh basketball was a big one yeah I, I think for me growing up uh soccer was my first sport fell in love with it then played baseball then played basketball um but in seventh grade when our team uh, when school was allowed for for you to play for a a, a team school sanctioned football team i started playing football and I'll, I'll never forget the feeling i had the first time i put on pads the first time i got my bell rung and it was really something that a uh, feeling that I, I never, I didn't get in any other sport. So quit everything else and solely focused on football. Um, was looking forward to possibly playing in college, did a couple athletic visitations as a wide receiver, but I blew my left knee out. That's the traditional sob story for a uh, high school football athlete. But um, I was looking then in college to fill the void that uh, not being able to compete on the field was, was going to leave. So I actually turned to uh, competitive esports. I don't know if anyone in the room is even familiar with esports or what that means, but esports is uh, electronic sports. It's uh, it's really a new trend that's that's been growing, and I was a part of that a long time ago, about seven years um, as a sophomore in college. I, with no money, uh, flew out to New York and then Columbus, Ohio, and um, placed fifteenth in a in a tournament and uh, went pro in in Halo of all things with uh, Major League Gaming. So my athletic course was. Uh, a, a little odd in that sense, but I think esports is definitely something that people are going to be much more aware of here in the near future, and it's something I'm really excited about to have to have been a part of uh, since the early days. One comment off of that, and then we'll take another question. Um, I one of my ventures, I have a lot of jobs this year, but one of them is working for a company called Nerdist. Uh, Nerdist is a really cool kind of multi-tiered entertainment company. They're owned by Legendary Entertainment, which made the Batman movies and things like that. And uh, I've been asked to run something called Nerdist Sports. Nerdist Sports is literally just my podcast right now, and it's great. You should subscribe on iTunes. It's wonderful. I had Keith Olbermann on and Chris Hardwick and some good guests. Uh, Dan Heron this week, uh, former MLB pitcher. That's a good conversation. But um, over the course of it, been thinking about how to build it out because we want to eventually cover all sports. We want to do video and writing and so forth. And I can tell you, Hunter, and you and I have talked about this you know, offline, mm -hmm. but basically eSports is going to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I do think that there's a little bit of a generational thing. I'm 41, so me being on Twitch, I have kids and stuff. It's probably not something that's going to happen. But I think recognizing what's what makes sense. There were, what, 35 million people watched the League of Legends final last year? Yeah, it's uh, so, yeah. second to only the Super Bowl in terms of viewership. Uh, I, I don't, you know, numbers don't lie, right? The um, extra 2% of viewing audience, maybe, in, that, in this case. Uh, and that means a lot, right? So uh, mm -hmm. in comparison, 33 million watched the League of Legends World Finals. And I think it was 23 million watched Game 7 of the World Series. This is the pinnacle of, of the great American pa pastime. And, and we've got 10 million more views on esports. So I think it's definitely something to, to look out for. I actually got in a huge Twitter argument. I'm sure it's not too far down on my Twitter, uh, at Do You Like Sports, with a couple of different Olympic athletes and, and X Games uh, medalists, because Halo was featured as a, as a, uh, as a, as a game at the, at, at the X Games here recently in, in, in mm -hmm. January. And so a lot of people were upset that uh, Halo players got the same gold medal that guys who have really, you know, sacrifice their lives for, which I completely understand. But 
I think, as you mentioned, it's a generational thing, right? I mean, I'm 25 and even then it's, it's, it's not even as heavy and thick as the participation in gaming is now for those who are maybe, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. And one of the really main arguments that I kept getting was that gaming isn't physical enough. And while I completely agree, you don't exert the same amount of force and physical energy as you would on, on the football field, but it's still a physical activity. And the reason that is, is because the, the sticks and the, ref, the reflexes are similar to that of a guy hitting a hundred mile an hour fastball, similar to a, a goalie snatching a 98 mile an hour Auto puck racing. out of the air. And, and that was another thing that, that these Olympic athletes came at me with was you can't, you can't compete in a sport when you're sitting down. And I thought that was really interesting because I think of NASCAR is, is a sport. And furthermore, in, in, uh, in line with the, the action sports genre of, of, of sporting, BMX bikes, right? That's a seat. And those guys are doing incredible things. And so I, I think it's a, it's a conversation that's going to go on for a long time, whether or not esports is, is actually a sport. But I really hope that's not the focus because I, I, it, I don't think it really even matters or, uh, whether or not it is a sport. It's an extremely intense competitive activity that takes the exact same amount of time training and, and energy to to go pro in just like you would as in in baseball so uh as you mentioned it's it's exciting that you know in 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 some corners of the world we we, we will view esports as part of that sports spectrum so uh 1310 ticket list asks hey guys what's paranoid fan all about that seems like a good thing that we should probably talk about hunter why don't you take the reins sure on that so uh, i'm the uh the co-founder of paranoid fan uh paranoid fan is a, a social mapping app so if you ever if you've ever used Waze, it's a lot like that but instead of pinning potholes or uh the, the nearest traffic jam you're pinning tailgates watch parties parking tickets food beer we want to make it really easy for fans to find fun and and those points of interest on game day. So when you're going to the game, you don't have to spend an extra 15, 20 minutes circling the, the venue, looking for a good parking spot. You can pull up our app, click on a parking uh, parking icon and get directions to it. So we make it, we hit, make it easy to find what matters most on game day and at different live uh, concert events. We've also got a geo chat that connects everyone that's at the event in a, in a live big group chat, if you will. So there's a lot of different fun things that we've got going on. As mentioned, to start this, uh, the, start the show, we're out here in San Francisco starting off our series a so we met with uh, google ventures yesterday and we've got a couple other um uh, big hitters lined up this week this is all really a, a uh this is all a reflection of our participation in TechCrunch uh first and future which is hosted by the nfl so two weeks ago we were invited by uh, TechCrunch and the nfl to pitch at the super bowl so the nfl wanted to look at three areas of technology that could really push the game forward one was the future athlete and how wearable uh, wearable monitors and sensors can help athletes better train and prepare for the game. The second one is bringing the game home, which is uh, looks at technology that can make the game more accessible and fun to watch from the couch. And then the third, which is what we competed in, was the future stadium. And how do we make the fan experience more fun and less of a headache for, for fans who are attending the game? So we placed runner up, uh, really excited with with the ability to, to participate. If you follow me on Twitter, at Do You Like Sports, the, the pitch that we made at TechCrunch is, is pinned up at the top. So if you want to check that out, you can. And you know, I've really been stressing to, to teams that we've been speaking with since, since Super Bowl 50 that you know, this is kind of a critical point for, for, for the fan experience. And I, and I know it's something that's top of mind for these guys because there's positions within these organizations where the, their titles are director of fan experience. The, these teams have people whose livelihood depends on making sure people have fun at the game and um, you know, NFL, NBA, MLB, all the leagues are up against up against it because there's so much technology at home. In a year from now, we'll be watching uh, football like we're at the game through virtual reality headsets. And so, with so much technology at home, it's we we've, we've got to equal the playing field at 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 game or at the game. And one of the things I always look at is that um, through virtual reality, you can duplicate what happens on the field. But you can't duplicate the feeling you get when you hug or high five the dude next to you that you've never even met before. That that's something that virtual reality can't duplicate. So there is still incentive and there is still a reason to go to games. But um, with so much technology at home, people are having less and less reasons to 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 do that. So we're excited because we think we we bring a, a good reason to the to the table to to get out there and and experience sports and music in a in a really fun environment with other people who like the same thing you do. Take a couple more questions, both from product hunt people. So, and they're kind of a similar question. So we'll take them both at once. Uh, Emily Hodgins and Layla. Gosh, I'm going to mess up your name, Layla. Uh, Bagarik. Bagarik. Uh, I apologize. I 
uh, basically asked about the future of sports tech and uh, innovations in sports tech. And, and uh, I'll, I'll take it first, and Hunter, you can jump in after. Um, we did an event in San Francisco a couple weeks ago uh, with IBM, uh, which was great, a lot of fun. Uh, my former Grantland colleague, Robert Mays, was there. Uh, some great guys from Dallas, a uh, great radio host, Ben and Skin. And uh, we talked about sports tech a little bit, and uh, I'll give kind of the cynical answer and the non-cynical answer. Basically, what I said at the time, uh, it had to do, to me, it was, it was biotech, it was biomed, that kind of stuff. I thought that that, you know, yeah, you can talk about wearables and, and, and tracking measures and so forth, but to me, it was how can we physically improve the human body? And, uh, you know, there are things people, famously, infamously, you're seeing players just go off to Germany and there's blood spinning and there's things like that, which is legal. Uh, that's fine. You can do that. And there are ways, uh, blood platelets and so forth and ways to generate oxygen and, and so forth. And then, of course, there are uh, somewhat illicit ways, which is uh, various uh, beta blockers, uh, performance enhancing drugs and so forth. And I think that we just have to accept the fact that that's going to be part of the landscape. It has been and it will be. Um, I can see a future where it is legalized in sports. I just think that we're going to get to the point where we can't really draw a distinction between, well, this guy had this procedure done and this guy took this medication or, or this substance or whatever. I think it's just going to kind of all meld together. I don't get upset about that. I have a Barry Bonds autograph bat given to me by my dad. Um, I just think that ultimately sports is the search for, uh, you know, higher achievement and so forth. And, and the human body can go you know, a pretty impressive way. Uh, but I think there's more to go, and uh, I, I do see that becoming part of it. I don't, I don't shy away from it. It doesn't make it. I don't find it controversial. I'll talk about politics. Not on this podcast. Not on this uh, chat. But I talk about uh, religion and politics and so forth. There are no taboos to me, and I don't find this to be taboo either. I think that this is something that is coming down the pike, and uh, athletes are looking for ways to improve, and, and that will be one of them. And, and I think that, uh, especially as the younger generation comes up, I think that the attitudes will change, and it won't be a, oh gosh, this is killing society. It'll be, yeah, sure. Well. This guy has to, uh, you know, run up and down the court for 42 minutes and dunk on guys and, and, and keep his heart rate under control and so forth. And there, that's a very tough thing to do. And I think that you'll find uh, that, that people take advantage of ways to, to do it better. Yeah, I think, I think the future of sports tech is extremely bright. Uh, you look back even five years ago and uh, nerds and jocks weren't necessarily a, a match made in heaven. They're really on polar opposite end of the spectrum. And now you see this emergence of the two combining where there's a benefit on both sides. And so I think the future of sports tech is, uh, since Jonah touched on how the, the future athlete will, will be affected, I think looking at just the fan experience, I think it's going to be so incredibly experiential, whether it's having the best possible uh, time of your life at a game or even being on the couch uh, watching a virtual reality headset. I remember I was at the uh, uh, NFL experience at Super Bowl 50, and one of the demos they had was, uh, was watching highlights in virtual reality. And it was just, it was unbelievable. Now the resolution is is way off from from I think being anywhere close to where it's true, fully immersive, because it just it, it looks like if, if you have glasses and you take them off, it looks like that right now with with virtual reality uh, capabilities. Still, there was a time where uh, there was a point where a player scored a touchdown, and when he spiked the football, the ball just came right at you. And I remember even jumping back, thinking, "Oh my God, I'm about, I'm about to get hit in the face." So. Um, I think the future sports tech is bright. I think it's going to be fully immersive and engaging, and it's going to totally revolutionize the way fans experience sports. Uh, Emily Hodgins has another question. She says, between your podcast and writing, what's a typical day look like for you, and how do you best manage your time? That's a great question because my days have changed dramatically. Uh, for the From 2011 to 2015, I wrote for a website called Grantland. They owned me exclusively, and uh, I willingly and happily signed up for that arrangement because Grantland was awesome. And a uh, very fun job, and I had I answered to one editor, uh, and uh, you know pretty much did my thing, and I knew what days I was writing, and it was all fine. Did do some TV for uh, ESPN. I would fly to Bristol and so forth. But generally speaking, it was very uh, the routine was set. I don't know what my routine is going to be this year because I'm just starting uh, with all these new jobs. Uh, I write for Sports Illustrated, SI.com as well, and uh, CBS Sports. And CBS Sports, I actually haven't even written anything for them. I'm just now starting. I'm going to be working on my first article for them, which will run this weekend. It's going to be, uh, I guess, a little bit of a spoiler. There's going to be some Oscars slash sports crossover kind of thing. Um, we've already got the template for it and so forth. But um, we'll see how it goes. CBS, you know, I'm supposed to do writing and also a bunch of video. I'm going to have a whole setup in my house and so forth. And I think you'll see a lot more of me doing this. Uh, maybe I'll be shaven at that point, though. I'll do my best. But um, 
yeah, generally speaking, yeah. It, it'll be that, and, and then it'll combine with SI, and, uh, and I'll probably do some TV, uh, and I'll be doing my podcast and so forth. So I think that the, the routine will vary from day to day, other than I will say that when it's working hours, when it's 9 to 5, uh, Monday to Friday, I'm really trying to, to bust it as much as I can because I have children, and uh, when they get home, I want to be present. Uh, so as best as I can, I'll try to bang it all out during the day, and if there are a couple late nights, that's okay. But uh, having done that, especially on the book front, on the book front, you're just like, I have a deadline, I have to finish the chapter. I'm going to be up until 5 a.m. or whatever. I don't want that anymore. I want to lead a kind of a normal and balanced life. Uh, I expect to work a fair bit more than 40 hours a week, but as much as I can get done in those 40, um, I will certainly try to do. We can do another question. Uh, Adam Stein, hey Adam, uh, a friend of mine, says, I've seen you tweeting about Vegas baseball team win totals and assorted projections. Is there one team you think will be better than the various projections and win lines and one you think will be worse? That will be my second article for CBS Sports, and I read that every year. Uh, again, another thing that is taboo in some circles, I wouldn't want athletes betting on sports, but as far as private citizens go, I don't see that as a problem. I'm not phased by that or by fantasy league or by fan duel, draft kings, none of that stuff bothers me. Uh, and I think it's a way to kind of engage on a higher level, actually, and it's really a lot of fun. So um, if you talk about uh, wagers, the only one that I ever really participate in, because I think that most sports betting is for chumps and you're, it's stacked against you the same way that craps or what roulette would be, is um, is over under bets on MLB teams, which is a kind of an obscure betting line and not that many people do it, which allows for some uh, arbitrage, some inefficiencies. And so um, they'll set a number. So let's say you're, you're a Texas Rangers fan, Hunter. So the Rangers might be 83 wins this year. Do you think they're going to be over? You think they're going to be under? You're always betting the VIG, so you might bet $110 to win $100, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, but if you feel confident in your bets, then you go ahead and you make your bets. And I've done this. I've made the bets for this has got to be seven or eight years now, and I've been writing this column for, I think, four or five. Um, <clears throat> and I'm pretty good at it. Uh, my success rate is pretty good. And uh, as far as which one I like over and which one under, um, a few overs jump out at me. Uh, one in particular was the Chicago Cubs. It's changed now. Uh, but if you're looking for a mega inefficiency, every year in Reno, Nevada, that's when the first set of lines come out at a place called the Atlantis Casino. And that's kind of testing the waters, and they're always out of whack. So I was able to get the Cubs over 90 wins, I think it was. They're going to win more than 90. Uh, the number now is like 94. It's a little more fair. But uh, went, went hard on the Cubs. Feel very good about the Cubs. They're, they're everybody's favorite. And, uh, you know, sometimes you try to zig when other people zag. But... This is a deep team. It has a lot of stars. It's well run. Uh, if a couple of injuries happen, they can withstand it. They're young, so the fear of regression is less. I expect them to be very good. I can, you know, don't ask me for World Series projection because I believe the playoffs to be almost random. But in the regular season, I see the Cubs doing well. Under, um, and again, this line has changed too, but at the time in Reno, the Detroit Tigers were pegged as 85 wins. I was under on the Tigers. I think that the Tigers are, are can be a competitive team, uh, but you know if they're going to win 86 plus, that implies that they're almost playoff caliber. I don't think they're that good. I like the addition of uh, Justin Upton and Jordan Zimmerman. I think those are good ball players, but they still have a lot of holes. Three, four lineup holes. I don't love the rotation. It's a functional rotation. They upgraded the bullpen. I mean, this is a pretty good team. I imagine they'll win something like 82 or 83 games, uh, but I felt pretty comfortable saying that they probably would not win well over 85. I didn't think that they would win 86 plus. Hey, Jonah, I, I got a uh, question as a um, result of some of your thoughts on uh, daily fantasy and the climate mm -hmm. there. Uh, very interesting because both raised ridiculous amounts of money, upwards of a billion dollars. I even, I believe, I know FanDuel maybe even uh, 400 million in, in one round. So, um, what are your thoughts on the climate there? I know that a lot of attorney generals are really coming down hard on daily fantasy. I agree with you. I think it's another way to engage. I played fantasy football myself, and I live for Sundays because of fantasy football. It keeps me interested in players on the Cleveland Browns or Jacksonville Jaguars, teams I would uh, players I would never care about otherwise. Or when the, my team, the Cowboys, is having a 4-12 and season, I can disengage from that <laughs> and engage in my fantasy football team. So it, it, it keeps me engaged, and I, I agree with you there. But – is is the climate so rocky now that they may not make it out of this of, of this year, or do you think that they can be regulated and uh, and and work with the government to uh, come up with a fair way to play and, and make this legal? The big problem, the thing that really blew things up, was uh, essentially insider trading. That what you would have is you'd have people from let's say FanDuel who'd have a ton of knowledge and they couldn't bet on their own platforms; so they just go on. DraftKings, and they'd bet a ton and they'd win. 
And the fear was that it was kind of like a stacked deck to use an analogy. Uh, I used to play poker. I wouldn't say I was a high level player, but I played it. And uh, if, you know, depends where you are. If you sit down at a four, eight limit table at the Mirage, yeah, most people can hack it. They're, the big players are not bothering with that because it's small change and you get a couple cards and you can win whatever. Uh, if you go to a high rollers table, and somebody like me posts up, I'm going to get murdered because I'm completely outclassed. <laughs> this is what, uh, I have no problem saying that. This is what it was like um, in, in uh, at least for, it seemed like in the recent past uh, with FanDuel and DraftKings, that although there was an opportunity to make money, you could take advantage of inefficiencies. You had people who made it their lives. In fact, a lot of them actually were ex-poker pros uh, or even current poker pros. And they just said, I'm going to just sit on my computer I'm going to have info being fed to me. I'm going to know about the last minute injury that's going to allow this guy who costs virtually no money to put him in my lineup and he's going to get 20 points and 10 rebounds tonight. And, and, and the regular person who has a job and kids and whatever could not possibly do that. And so it just became very difficult to try to beat people of that caliber and, and the stats they were throwing out. And I don't want to misrepresent. So I'll just say that it was a very small percentage of the playing populace that was collecting the vast majority of the winnings. Um, so you need to be careful. If you come into it and you say, it is like playing craps, I'm going to go to the casino and odds are I'm going to lose, but I'm going to have some fun and maybe I'll drop 20 or 40 bucks. That's fine. When I go to Vegas, I sit down, I have a couple hundred dollars and I'll, I'll play blackjack or whatever it is. I know that the odds are mathematically stacked against me. I have a drink in my hand. I'm with my buddies. And if I lose, I walk away from the table. It's, it's not money I'm ever going to miss. And I don't care. It's, I've, I've been entertained. Mm -hmm. If you approach it like that, that's fine. But the, the, the ease of use of the platform, the fact that the platform is so slick and so great, actually, both FanDuel and DraftKings, and I should preface this by saying I have not played either, but I've watched friends play and I understand how it works. It can make it addictive. It can make it to the point where you're just like, oh, you're going to throw bad money in after good and keep losing and keep losing. You can't get out of this spiral. So if you go in and you want to play and you treat it like craps or fantasy sports or whatever, and it's just, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll throw in a couple bucks and if I lose, that's fine, fine. But I think that if you, the concern uh, that the regulators have uh, is that it could get to the point where people are reticent about it because they feel that, well, people who are trying to invest are just, it's a rigged game and they're going to lose. So that's the only thing that I would caution is they might be able to fix it to some extent uh, where insider trading goes away, but it's still going to be these kind of the equivalent of Wall Street high frequency traders who are going to dominate. And you need to go in. And even if you know a lot about sports, I feel like I know a lot about sports. I would expect to lose. I expect to lose. I consume baseball all the time. That should give you an idea of somebody, you know, maybe you are a fan of the Cleveland Indians or whatever you come in. You're probably going to lose. If you come in with that expectation, okay. Uh, what else we got? One new comment waiting. Let's go here. Uh, oh, this is a question for you, Hunter. How do you think VR and other immersive experiences will affect in-person ticket sales? You, this is definitely a hobby horse of yours, so go for it. Yeah, so I, I think it's, I think virtual reality could create a situation where you've got 60,000 seat stadiums and only 6,000 people show up. It is extremely, extremely powerful technology. Like I said, the, uh, even just, just walking out to the 50 yard line in virtual reality for the coin toss, uh, I think it was the Lions and Packers playing or Lions and Bears. I mean, that gave me chills. I felt like I was on the state, on the field. It's, it's, it's truly incredible technology. If you've, if you've ever had a chance to try out Oculus or some of the other virtual reality um, technologies out there, get in there. I mean, it's truly unbelievable. I, I mentioned earlier, the resolution is still a ways off. And, I, and I, it's, I'm a gamer myself, so it reminds me of the days when we were playing Nintendo 64 Madden. And then throughout every year, the graphics got better and better. And I'm sure that'll only be accelerated even further with virtual reality because all that technology is already in place to make the, the quality of the video even better. So I think, I think it will affect, I think it will affect um, ticket sales and incentives to go out uh, to the stadium. And that's even more reason for, for that's my why, that's my motive for, for building the product we've built at Paranoid Fan to get people to, and even if it's not going to the game, it's at least going to a bar or a buddy's place to meet up and, and watch sports together. Because I think everyone uh, can agree that sports are more fun when it's enjoyed with friends. So I think that's something that virtual reality can't also duplicate either because I think when you put on that headset, you disengage from the the, the room or the people around you. So there's, there's, there's certain places that virtual reality can't go that a actual live experience can go and, and vice versa. And that's really the, the, that's the complication that teams are going to face when it comes to providing more incentive to, to come to the games or interact and, 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 and get out there and, and root for the team in a, in a capacity that's beyond just being on the couch. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, our friend uh, Augustine wants to know about Kanye West tweet storms. Apparently he's going off right now. 
I'm actually going to be, I'm going to real talk this for a second. Um, the, read the article written by Molly Lambert uh, at MTV News. And Molly Lambert was a former colleague of mine in Grantland. MTV News has assembled a great staff uh, led by a guy named Dan Fearman, who was kind of the boss of Grantland, him and Simmons. And, um, and Molly talks about the idea of uh, going off of SSRIs and, and things like that. And there, there's medical stuff. I don't want to, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not going to get too far into it. Uh, but I, from the outside, I'd be a little concerned. I, from my understanding, uh, it's been that kind of thing going off of, of medication and changing things up. And, uh, you know, we, we don't know when it's social media and you don't want to speculate too much, but that is the report that, that, that there are things going on. I generally try not to belittle people anyway. I don't think it's nice, uh, you know, if they're truly cruel, that's one thing. But I think that if they, if someone's having trouble or whatever, it's not the best thing to pile on. Don't pile on Kanye. I, I wouldn't, that doesn't strike me as, as something that's a classy thing to do or whatever. The tweets might see, be funny and weird or whatever, but, uh, I just would, uh, empathy is an important thing that we should all try to practice. And if somebody is, is comes off as uh, as appearing to be a certain way, uh, just try to keep in mind what might be going on in their lives, whether it's that or anything else. And, uh, you know, be, don't be a dick, basically. Can I say that? I just said it, so whatever. Sorry, Blab. And I think there's actually, you know, because because we're we're doing we're out here in San Francisco, Joan and I are actually in the same house right now, but we're out here doing the same thing. We're asking for money to... We to are. Uh, to make our ideas in actuality. And so I think Kanye is just trying to, trying to do the exact same thing. It's just the way that Kanye goes about it. It's just much more loud and, and maybe controversial. So I think it looks and appears like he's off his rocker, but I really think his head is in the right place. I, I know it's a little bizarre to go on Twitter and ask the CEO of, of Facebook for, for money. I don't know if that's something that we'd attempt, but um, I, I think he's, he's in the right place. He's, he's obviously a creative guy that's got ideas and and it takes money beyond his own personal earnings to to make those ideas in actuality. So, I think uh, I'm with you there. Leave Britney alone. Leave Kanye alone. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, anything else, guys and gals, before we uh, truck? I mean, Hunter, is there anything else that we wanted to get across um, about Paranoid Fan or Product Hunt or anything like that? Any other sports topics we wanted? To yeah, cover? I just wanted to thank the Product Hunt guys for. Uh, giving us the opportunity to host the live chat. Hopefully we can do more in the future. I think uh, the conversation around sports tech is extremely exciting and something that we, we look to continue the dialogue on. So if you get an opportunity, uh, follow me on Twitter at do you like sports, follow uh, our, our company's Twitter handle as well at paranoid fan. And more than anything, just download the app, check it out. It's on iPhone now uh, with the, if we're out here, uh, we can raise the series a we'll we'll get android developed here by the by the summer for all the baseball fans who are looking forward to opening day so check it out paranoid fan it's a great great app to get you more engaged on game day and, and help you find what matters most whether it's parking tickets food beer or, or even your friends when you get lost we all know how much of a headache that can be so we alleviate that pain and and look forward to, to building a strong community of users that uh look forward to having fun at, at different games and, and concerts uh, I echo all that stuff. Absolutely. I would not have involved myself uh, with Hunter and Augustine and the people at Paranoid Fan if I didn't put them in the product and the people 100%. Uh, just from my perspective, like I said, two books, extra 2%, and uh, up, up, and away. They're both fun. Read them. Uh, SI, CBS Sports, all that. And then uh, please listen to the Ner to the Joan and Carrie podcast on the Nerdist Network. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. It's a lot of fun, and uh, that's kind of entrepreneurial what I'm trying to do over there. I'm trying to build a sports presence at a place that didn't have a sports presence. Uh, so stay tuned for more stuff. You'll see another big podcast being introduced soon, let's say that. And uh, there'll be other stuff as well. So uh, tune in, and uh, I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.